Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to today's webinar presentation. Today will be the final webinar out of a six-part series as part of our Forest Invasive Spring Series. To learn about the rest of the series, please visit www.forestinvasives.ca. My name is David Nisbet, and I'm the coordinator for the Forest Invasives Project at the Invasive Species Centre in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. The Invasive Species Centre is a non-profit organization created in 2011. We connect stakeholders, knowledge and technology to prevent and control the spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy and society. We build networks of experts and stakeholders to identify and act on priority invasive species. We provide funding, coordinate and lead projects in natural and applied science, technology transfer, outreach and education. And we consolidate and disseminate information to raise awareness leading to the prevention of harmful invasive species. If you want to learn more about the ISC, you can visit our webpage at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. Our speaker today is Rochelle Gagnon. Rochelle is the coordinator with the Ontario Invasive Plant Council. She has been with the OIPC since its inception in 2007. Prior to that, she worked with CFIA's Emerald Ash Borer Project and as a terrestrial outreach liaison with the Invading Species Awareness Program. Rochelle sits on many other groups that deal with invasive species, including the Canadian Council on Invasive Species and the Midwest Invasive Plant Network. If you have a question for Rochelle during the presentation, please enter it into the side panel of the GoToWebinar program, and we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible with the remaining time at the end of the webinar. At this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Rochelle, and she will take it from here. Thank you, David. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the Invasive Species Center for inviting me to speak to you today. And I really hope that you find my presentation um, informative. I will get right to it because I do actually have a lot of information to cover for you guys. So first off, a quick overview of my presentation. I will briefly discuss the OIPC, um, who we are, and then we will talk about invasive plants, um, what they are, why they are a problem, and how they get here and spread. I will also, also briefly talk about best management practices using integrated pest management. And this is important to understand uh, when you are creating a management plan for invasive plants. I will then go over some of the common forest invaders and discuss their identifying features, impact, and some control options for each of them. So we'll just get started. The OIPC was formed in 2007 to provide a coordinated provincial response to the growing threat of invasive plants. It was created and is compiled by rep representatives from a variety of organizations and agencies. So on our board are levels, all levels of government, nonprofit organizations, academia, First Nations, and industry. And if you'd like more information about the Ontario Invasive Plant Council, you can check out our website at www.ontarioinvasiveplants.ca. So I'd like to just clarify the difference between alien um, and invasive plants. So alien plants are those that have been accidentally or deliberately introduced into an area beyond their normal range. And so not all alien plants are invasive. Invasive plants, however, are defined as harmful alien species whose introduction or spread threatens the environment, economy, society, or human health. So preventing the spread is the first step in ensuring that they do not become established. The ecological effects are often irreversible once they have become established, and they're extremely difficult and costly to control or eradicate. So really exact figures um, to controlling all invasive plants in Canada are not known. We don't have those numbers, but what we, I can say is that um, there has been information on just controlling one species, uh, Phragmites, and it said, uh, the people who were doing the study said that it was between almost $850 to uh, about $1,000 per hectare to control Phragmites, and that would obviously be over a number of years. So as you can see, that price Point is going to get higher and higher as, as you have to as you have bigger infestations and more fragments to control. 
So how do these plants spread? The pathway is the route in which invasive plants move from one area to another. Pathways can be led, uh, can be human-led, so things like tourism and travel, trade and recreational activities, or they can spread through natural ways such as wind, water, and by animals. Throughout the presentation, I'll be going through various control measures for the five species I'll be addressing. And I wanted to mention that the OAPC has created 12 best management practices guides, which can be found on our website. And so these guides outline information about specific plants so we go over the history of how they arrived, the biology and life cycle of the plant, preferred habitats and control measures, as well as restoration and reporting tools. So in order to control any species, it's important to look at best management practices using an integrated pest management method, an IPM. And this is true for all the plants that I'll be covering in this presentation. So IPM refers to the practice of preventing or reducing damage caused by pests uh, by using the best available information along with a variety of ecologically and economically sustainable approaches and control methods. So an IPM approach for invasive plants will depend on, few, on a few factors, which include the life cycle and biology of the plant, the time of year for action, the locations of the plants, so are there other sensitive species or species at risk nearby, the size of the infestation, and the skill level, so, such as your identification skills or your plotting. Skills. So as with, many, uh, with any invasive plant management plan, the successful eradication will most likely require several years and a variety of tools and approaches. Ideally, a management plan will involve replanting native plants to prevent soil erosion and help outcompete future invasions of other invasive plants. Controlling an invasive plant before it becomes established is ideal as it will reduce the impact. So some tips that might help in developing a feasible long-term strategy are to try controlling invasive plants when their infestation is small or not well established. So look for outlying populations first to prevent further spread. Try to remove the most prolific seed producers first and sites with high sun exposure. Concentrate on high priority areas such as the most productive or sensitive part of a woodlot or a favorite natural area. Consider dedicating a certain time each year to control, so make it a joint effort with neighboring landowners and land managers. Plan to replant native plants once the invasives have been eradicated or are under control. Replanting with native species will help to restore soil conditions and jumpstart a natural restoration. So with that in mind, my next um, part of the presentation is to actually go through some of these common invaders that are often found uh, along forest edges or within forests. The first, excuse me, the first species we'll look at is garlic mustard. And so garlic mustard is a biennial herb, which means it has a two-year life cycle and is a member of the uh, mustard family. And this family of plants is actually an aggressive group of plants. It is native to Europe and was introduced to North America as a food source and used as a herbal medicine by settlers in the late 1800s. The first records of this plant in Ontario um, are in Toronto back in 1879, Ottawa in 1891, and even in Kingston in 1898. It is thought to, uh, to have been brought here through the horticulture and medicinal trade and is spread by a variety of means and uh, can be spread through mud on boots, mountain bikes, and other equipment that is carried out of infested areas to new areas. Garlic mustard can grow in a variety of habitats and in a wide range of soils from clay to loam to sand. It's commonly found in disturbed site, sites such as forest edges, fence lines, roadsides, trail sides, and urban gardens, as well as in forest understories, but can also spread into invasion-resistant habitats, so things such as previously undisturbed mature forests. It will grow in full sun, full shade, but seems to grow best in damp, partially shaded soil, such as the understories of temperate forests in southern Ontario. The identification features of garlic mustard in its first year are different than those of its second year. So I will go over both stages. The first year plants grow as a basal rosette. So that's a low growing, so low growing leaves arranged in a circle at ground level. There are three to four leaves per rosette and the leaves are dark green and kidney shaped from two to 12 centimeters in diameter. They have scalloped margins and deep veins uh, which make them look like they are wrinkled. 
And they have a slender white taproot, which is shaped like a nest. This is a key identifying feature of garlic mustard. In its second year, the flowering stalk reaches up to one meter in height. The stem is hairy, and the leaves on the flowering stalks are triangular and sharply toothed. The leaves are alternate, from three to eight centimeters long. Um, the flowers are white with four petals, and they flower early in May. So you will probably see garlic mustard uh, flowering right now. The seed pods of garlic mustard are long, about two and a half to six centimeters long, and contain between 10 to 20 small black seeds. Garlic mustard does not appear uh, to require disturbance to become established. This makes it a, a threat to natural, to healthy mature forests, as I mentioned before. It can enter, establish, establish itself, and become the dominant plant in a forest understory in just five to seven years. It actively displaces native spring ephemeral wildflowers, such as trillium, through direct competition, and it changes the soil and leaf litter. Garlic mustard is allelopathic, which means it emits a chemical from the roots, which, which prevents the growth of other plants and grasses. These chemicals also affect the growth and regeneration of mycorrhizal fungi, which is a beneficial fungi in, in the soil that helps trees and plants absorb nutrients, water, and water in their roots. The effect can last for years after garlic mustard has been removed. Our forests have evolved to depend on the leaf litter to function properly. Leaf litter provides a layer of slowly decomposing organic matter. Garlic mustard leaves have a high nutrient content. When they die, they accelerate the rate of decay of native leaf, leaf litter, altering the natural decomposition cycle and changing the structure and function of the forest ecosystem. Garlic mustard affects wildlife by changing the composition of the litter layer on the forest floor. It then reduces habitat for ground nesting birds and affects the habitat for salamanders and other forest dwelling animals. Areas with higher density deer populations may promote garlic mustard invasions because deer tend to prefer browsing on native plant species over garlic mustard and as a result may reduce the competition for, from nearby native plants. Garlic mustard also affects other wildlife by reducing the amount of native pollen, seeds and fruit available due to the reduction of native species as a result of competition. So in our um, BMP document that I've talked about, we uh, talk about control options and one of the um, tables that we have is uh, shows you the size of the infestation and what method of control might be best for you depending on how dense your population is. So I won't go too too much more into this but if you'd like to take a look at it you can always check out the website and find our BMPs on there. I'll talk a little bit more of the actual control methods for garlic mustard. And so, as you can see, if hand pulling is a viable option for eradication um, of smaller populations, and this is the, the uh, system you want to go with, then it's best done in early spring before the plants um, have set seed. The entire root should be removed to avoid resprouting from buds on roots. So I'm just, oh, there you go. I'm not sure if my slide, I'm on slide 18, David, I don't know if that's... Yeah, that's the slide that's up right now. Okay. Um, so the, the entire root... Oh, I think, yeah, thank you. Yeah. The entire root should be removed to avoid resprouting from buds on the roots. Hand pulling will create soil disturbance, which will stimulate the germination of seeds, and so it is important to repeat this method more than once and monitor it regularly. It may look worse, actually, before it looks better. Basal cutting is another option and involves cutting the second year plants at the base of the stem. And the best time to do this is just after the plants flower but before they have produced seed. Garlic mustard's plant can flower at different times so it may, be need, it may need to be repeated more than once in a season. And basal cutting is preferable to hand pulling because it reduces the soil disturbance. Mowing is similar to basal cutting but it is non-selective. Clipping the flower head will prevent seed production, but must be repeated continually until the end of the growing season as it encourages new flowers to emerge. Some native uh, plants have been shown to outcompete garlic mustard when planted at higher densities than are usually found in the forest. So plants like bloodroot and Canada mayapple are examples of such species. Planted at densities of 9 or 11 plants per square meter, they can successfully outcompete garlic mustard. And this method is best used in a combination with other control me measures or as a result, uh, a restoration measure in areas of 
where garlic mustards have been removed and the high density planting can outcompete the growth from the seed bank. There are a few more control options on the next slide. Um, prescribed burning is another method used in controlling garlic mustard. And this is usually used in areas where fire is part of a natural disturbance regime, such as a degraded tall grass oak savannas or oak woodlands. It is not recommended in deciduous forest ecosystems as burning may further reduce the leaf litter layer, making the site more conducive to garlic mustard growth. For more information on burning, please see our BMPs and take into consideration the proper permits must be in place prior to conducting a burn. Now, if you're going to go with chemical control, it is important to ensure that you are following all regulations, including the Ontario Pesticide Act and Ontario Regulation 6309. Take into consideration the life cycle and the physiology of the plant. And so with garlic mustard spot application of herbicide in the early spring or late fall, um, while other plants are dormant, may provide control of garlic mustard populations. This process will need to be repeated for several years if there is an existing seed bank. Uh, sorry. So, sorry, there's a number of ways to apply herbicides, such as through foliar spray and um, wick or wiper application, and again, this is covered more thoroughly in the BMPs. Biological control is the use of a herbivore, predator, or disease, or other natural um, enemy to reduce established populations of invasive species. Most invasive species succeed because they have no or few predators or natural enemies in their new habitat. Biological control aims to reestablish an ecological balance between the introduced species and its natural enemies. Highly host-specific natural enemies are selected from spe for the, the species' native range and are moved to the site of the new invasion. This is done after extensive research to ensure it will only affect the problem species. For garlic mustard, four weevils have been selected for further study, and one in particular is quite promising. Because it's, it is a root-crown mining weevil and its presence on garlic mustard in trials has shown increased plant mortality, reduced biomass, and reduced seed production. Further studies are being conducted. So we'll move on to dog strangling vine. Dog strangling vine is a perennial herbaceous vine native to eastern Ukraine and southwestern Russia. It is a member of the milkweed family and has very similar characteristics to our native milkweed. And it is commonly referred to as pale swallowwort. The first recorded specimen in Ontario is believed to have been collected in Toronto in 1899. It is thought that it was introduced through a horticultural or accidental intro introduction and can be spread through recreational and mach machinery by plant, uh, plant parts being carried in mud or on equipment. As well, the fluffy seeds are easily spread by wind and water. Dog strangling vine thrives in limestone-based soils, and in Ontario, it's found in a wide range of habitat types, such as old fields, shrubs, thickets, um, along Great Lakes coasts, in stream banks, along roadsides, in plantations, in forests, in tall grass prairies, and in alvars. It prefers full sun, but it can invade closed canopy forests and dominate ground cover, particularly where there is gaps in the canopy. <clears throat> the DSV has a woody rootstock, and the stems can twine and climb depending on the available structures like trees. Um, they can be somewhat downy and have fine hairs and can form dense mats of vegetation from twining around itself. The leaves are opposite, smooth and green, uh, with entire to wavy margins. The leaves are round, uh, rounder and smaller near the base of the plant, largest at the midsection and smaller and narrower towards the top of the plant. The flowers come out in late June and July and emerge at the axles of the leaves in, a, in clusters of 5 to 20 flowers. They have five petals and are red-brown or maroon to pinkish in color. And the pod-like fruit form in late July and August and are long and slender. And the pods split open to release the seeds that are attached to feathery tufts of hair that aid in the spread uh, by wind. So dog strangling vine has two lookalikes, um, also invasive species. So dog strangling vine is closely related to um, black DSV, or black swallowwort, which is called in the States, Sinantium nigrum. And it is more commonly found in the U.S., but has been found in isolated locations in the, in the GTA, Ottawa, and southern Quebec. 
key ID features to di differentiate black um, DSV and pale DSV is the flowers. Black DSV has much darker flowers, more purple to almost black, and hairs on the inner surface of the petals. White swallowwort is another look-alike, and it has a cream-colored flower and has not yet become well-established within North America. It occurs sparsely in the northeastern U.S. So the impacts from DSV uh, to biodiversity is that it forms extensive monospecific stands that outcompete native plants for space, water, and nutrients. It produces a chemical through, through allelopathy that alter ecosystem structure and function and inhibits native plants from growing. DSV negatively affects wildlife by altering habitats. Dense stands have, have reduced habitat for grassland birds such as savanna sparrow, bobolink, and eastern meadowlark. Deer and other browsers avoid DSV, which could increase the pressure on native plants that are more palatable. DSV impacts monarch butterfly that rely on native milkweed when laying eggs. Monarchs mistake DSV for native milkweed, lay eggs on it, which cannot sustain the feeding monarch larva. This has led to declines in monarch populations. It has been observed that both pollinators and plant-eating insects tend to avoid it, which leads to the decline in birds and small animals that depend on these insects as a food source. So again, here's another uh, table showing the control options depending on the size of your infestation. For, if you'd like to take a longer look at it, feel free to go on our website and, and look through the DMPs. So I'll go again into the control method. Um, digging up DSV can be a very effective management option for small populations. It's important that the entire plant is dug up so that it is not able to re-sprout. Mowing DSV, which um, so DSV which has been mowed, can re-sprout rapidly and may still produce flowers and seeds. However, properly timed mowing can be an effective way to reduce the amount of seed that is produced, even though it will not eradicate the population. Clipping works to reduce seed production and will work well if done prior to plant to the plant producing seed. And pulling can also be effective in reducing the seed production. Seed pod removal is another option. So the best time to remove the seed pods is just before they start to dry out and split. This would be early to mid-August with a follow-up removal um, in the end of September. And this can be used in combination with mowing for increased effectiveness. This will not eradicate the plant, but it will, again, prevent the further spread of it. Tarping is another option. So tarping refers to covering an invasive plant population with a dark material to block the sunlight and to cook the root system. So tarping is not recommended in a low light area. You need a lot of light for this. When tarping, uh, it is important to first cut down the DSV stems and cover the area with a dark colored tarp or other heavy material. Weigh the tarp down to ensure that it, and then ensure that it receives adequate sunlight to cook the soil. Biocontrol is another option. There is, a re there is research being done into a biocontrol for dog strangling vine, and field trials have begun for, host for a host-specific European moth, hy the Hypena opulenta, and more information is available or will be available as these uh, tests are conducted. They are also looking into some native dog vein beetles that nibble on DSV, and tests are being done to see how effective that is. Chemical control is also an option, and if Doing it, uh, obviously you have to follow the proper regulations. So Arsenal is the only product on, in Ontario that has DSV on the label, and the active ingredient for Arsenal is Imazapir. Arsenal is a post and pre-emergent control product. Arsenal is systemic, so therefore it gets absorbed by the plant, plant's leaves and is circulated to the roots. Arsenal is non-selective, and therefore reseeding while using this product will not work. Glyphosate is used in the United States for controlling DSV, but it is currently not on any labels in Canada. So we'll move into invasive honeysuckles. So there are 16 honeysuckle species found in Ontario, ten of which are introduced. Four of those are what we discuss in our BMPs, and they are considered invasive in Ontario. Those four include 
Tartarian, Amir, Moro, and Bell's honeysuckles. So invasive honeysuckles is a collective term for those four several shrub form plants um, in the Lonicera genus. It was introduced, or they were introduced as ornamental species in the late, in the 18th century. As early as the 1920s, it was starting to be noted that they were spreading beyond the original plants. And by the 1960s, they were reported abundant in pastures and forested areas. Honeysuckles can thrive in a variety of habitats and soil types and do colonize along the edges of woodlots and open areas. So these honeysuckles are deciduous, multi-stemmed, woody shrubs, and the exact form they take depends on the particular species. Um, but they do have some common features. So common features to the invasive honeysuckles are that they have simple opposite leaves, they have showy flowers, they have thornless branches, and the berries, they all vary, and they, those berries remain throughout the winter. They can hybridize, which also makes it difficult to identify which one is which. So I'll go through a couple of them. Amur honeysuckle is a native of central and northeastern China, Korea, and parts of Japan. And the earliest record of the plant in North America is from the Dominion Arboretum in Ottawa back in 1896. It is a deciduous multi-stem shrub that can grow to heights of 6 meters. Tatarian is native to western and central Russia, introduced to North America in the 1750s, and widely used in horticulture, and it grows up to 5 meters in height. Moro is native to Japan and was brought to North America in the late 1800s and was considered a solution for areas prone to soil erosion. It is smaller than the other bush honeysuckles, um, growing up to about 2.5 meters in, in height. And Bells is a hybrid of Moro and Tatarian and shares characteristics of both parent plants. So this one is actually considered to be a particularly aggressive invasive shrub. The invasive shrubs can look similar to some of the native honeysuckles, um, including fly honeysuckle, swamp fly honeysuckle, and northern bush honeysuckle. Some ways to tell the difference between the native and the invasive species are that the native species have a solid stem, while the invasive stem is, is hollow. The, pit, the pith of the invasive honeysuckle is often light colored or white, while the native is more of a dark brown. The invasives also leaf out earlier. Honeysuckles can also look very similar to dog strangling vine. So some of the impacts um, from honeysuckle is that these honeysuckles can form dense patches, which prevents other species from growing. They reduce light and nutrients available to other plants. They have allelopathic qualities. Uh, they may negatively impact songbirds as the, as the songbirds feed on the fruits. Um, but the berries are less nutritious, nutritious than the native shrub species. And when they invade the interior forest, they can change the vegetation community by outcompeting native species. They also can threaten species at risk. So again, just um, a quick view of the table which shows the, prop the best control options for the density and size of your infestation. And then I'll just go over some of the methods, the control methods. So there are a number of options to control invasive honeysuckles, such as um, pulling, which can be effective for small, young populations. Young shrubs can be pulled when soils are moist, and it's easier to remove the shrubs in the spring. However, it can cause disturbances to spring ephemerals, and so we actually recommend that hand pulling be done in the fall. Uh, clipping over a prolonged period of time, so something like three to five years, can effectively control infestations. Cutting and girdling are also often used to remove medium shrubs and may work best if followed immediately, immediately by an application of herbicide. Mowing can be done as soon as the plants leaf out, but must be monitored closely and repeated throughout the season. Also, it will need to be done for several years. As far as grazing, goats will browse honeysuckle populations, so that is uh, one that people have used. Burning is also an option. Land managers have reported uh, successful control using prescribed fires as long as the fires are hot enough to be uh, to hot enough and repeated at regular intervals. Sorry, I got ahead of myself again. Chemical control is used in some cases, and regulations must be followed 
if this is the preferred option. So there are various ways to control using chemicals such as foliar spray for larger thickets um, where there is little risk of harming non-target species and the cut stump method where it is applied immediately after the shrub has been cut. And as far as biocontrol, in the case of honeysuckle, there are no large-scale scale biocontrols uh, currently available. However, research is ongoing. We're going to move on to Japanese knotweed. So Japanese knotweed is a perennial herbaceous plant in the buckwheat family. And Japanese knotweed is native to Eastern Asia, where it is relatively uncommon and one of the first species to grow after eruptions or disturbances on volcanic slopes. It was introduced to North America as a horticultural plant in the late 19th century. It was widely planted as an ornamental, and it was also used for purposes of erosion control and as forage for livestock. Uh, it is regarded as one of the world's top 100 worst invasive species by the Global Invasive Species Database. Japanese knotweed grows most vigorously in full sunlight, preferring open exposed sites. It can also grow in deep shade in riparian zones. It prefers moist soils like those in riparian or wetland areas. However, it can be found growing in disturbed areas along roadsides, rail beds, old homesteads, and along woodland forest edges. It grows in a variety of site conditions. It is salt tolerant and it's able to survive in extreme climates such as volcanic plains and it has been found growing in heavily populated areas of Japan and in soils contaminated with heavy metals. Japanese knotweed is a woody plant with stems that are hollow, smooth and purple to green in color and reach a diameter of 2.5 centimeters. The hollow jointed stems have reddish brown solid nodes surrounded by a papery sheath. It's called a stipule. And this is a trait that is unique to members of the buckwheat family. The stems of Japanese knotweed die back uh, each fall and the dead stalks remain standing over the winter. The numerous new stems emerge in the spring resembling asparagus spears. It grows in large bamboo-like clumps, reaching heights of 1, 3, 1 to 3 meters. Japanese knotweed leaves are oval to triangular with a pointed tip and a flat base. The leaves have long, a long stalk arising from the stem. And they grow along the stem in a distinctive zigzag pattern. The flowers of Japanese knotweed are small, white, green, and bloom in sprays near the end of the stem and at the leaf axils in late July or August all the way to October. Japanese knotweed quickly develops large underground root, um, root systems called rhizomes, which account for two-thirds of the plant's total mass. Japanese knotweed has a few lookalikes, invasive lookalikes. <clears throat> Giant knotweed is native to northern Japan. It has been found in southern Ontario, mostly in the southeast uh, regions, so Leeds County and Ottawa and the surrounding area, and also in the Niagara region. Giant, hogweed, or giant knotweed was also introduced as an ornamental species. Giant knotweed is Japanese knotweed bigger batter sibling. It grows up to four meters in height. The leaves are bigger um, and it's just as invasive. Stems are hollow and light green, also remain standing when dead. The leaves are alternate and heart shaped and they look like an elephant ear and have uh, wavy margins. The flowers bloom from July to September. They are greenish white and in clusters which are closer to the stem than in Japanese knotweed. And uh, Himalayan knotweed is native to the mountain regions in southern Asia. Uh, right, um, there are also known populations in Ontario, however it has been reported in BC. Sorry, there are no known populations in Ontario, however they have been reported in BC, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. This plant grows up to two meters in height, uh, has a red stem and leaf stalks. It has hollow stem and they remain standing when dead. The leaves are alternate and are long and thin, up to 20 centimeters long and 10 centimeters wide. This plant can easily be mistaken for Himalayan balsam because the leaves are very similar, but they are not serrated like Himalayan balsam. Flowers bloom in July and September and are pink to white clusters. The Bohemian knotweed um, is a hybrid species of Japanese and giant knotweed. 
And it is possible that it does exist in Ontario since both parent plants are present here, although it has not been reported to date. This hybrid plant may be uh, more aggressive than its parent plants by taking on the superior aspects of both, and it may also be more difficult to control. It has been reported in BC, Quebec, Newfoundland, and New Brunswick. This hybrid, uh, sorry, fruits are also winged and shiny and uh, small and black. So the impacts for Japanese knotweed, um, Japanese knotweed can severely degrade the quality of the wetland and riparian habitats where it becomes established. Dense thickets of knotweed can reduce sunlight penetration by more than 90% and its thick mats of dead and decaying vegetation in fall and spring prevent other plant species from growing at all by shading them out. Studies done by Cornell University have found that knotweed can reduce native species ground cover within a Japanese knotweed stand to 0%. The result of this is reduced native plant biodiversity and lowered in invertebrate densities. Established knotweed stands do not support the same numbers of native amphibians, reptiles, birds, or mammal populations. For example, it has been shown that the native green frog presence is dramatically reduced in knotweed stands in riparian and wetland areas. Although further study is needed, it is believed that Japanese knotweed may have allelopathic qualities and the roots contain unique compounds which may alter soil chemistry or prohibit the growth of native species. Again, just a quick look at the control options based on the size of infestation of Japanese knotweed. And we'll go into some of the control measures. So mowing and cutting um, is one of the options. So continual cutting with a brush mower at least once per month through the growing season will eventually weaken the rhizomes. And this can take at least a minimum of five years. Digging young plants, so includes best includes the entire rhizome, can eradicate new or early infestations. Japanese knotweed has a large and dense root system and will quickly re-sprout when pulled or dug if the roots are not completely removed. Excavation, so for, the lar for large populations, full-scale excavation with heavy machinery has proven to be a method of quick eradication in the UK. This, is this usually involves creating deep pits, so more than five meters in depth, and excavating all soil up to two meters deep that has been infested with Japanese knotweed. Then bury it in these deep pits which are aligned with root barriers. Grazing is another option. The young shoots of Japanese knotweed are edible for livestock and horses when they first appear in the early spring. Grazing will not eradicate Japanese knotweed but can suppress the growth and prevent further spread. Tarping is another option for Japanese knotweed. In the case of Japanese knotweed, it's important to make sure that the tarp um, is spread out further than the infestation itself as the rhizomes will actually spread outward to find the light past the infestation. Weed barriers used by landscapers or blue polytarps are a good option as well. Chemical, uh, if you are going to use chemical control, it's important to ensure that you are following all the regulations. Various methods of applications can be used, so you can spray isolated or new populations. Um, you can repeated cutting and allowing the plants to grow and then spraying them after has proven to be successful and foliar spray and wick or wiper applications can be used. So be sure to follow and read the label of the herbicides before use um, for safety considerations and proper rates of application. Biological control. Several predators and pathogens have been studied for the use as a biocontrol. In the United Kingdom, two potential biocontrol agents, a leaf spot fungus and a psyllid, have been identified. The psyllid is a sap-sucking insect and has been released in quarantine areas for a five-year trial in the UK. There is work being done to have the psyllid released in Canada as well. So the last plant I'm going to talk about is common buckthorn or European buckthorn. Um, it is a perennial shrub native to Europe and was likely introduced by European settlers in, eight, in the 1880s and started to become widespread in the 90s. The plant was planted widely um, and used by settlers for use in hedgerows and windbreaks after a period of deforestation in the province caused by settlement and development. It really started to become a concern to the agricultural community when it was discovered that it is a secondary host to oak crown rust and soybean aphid. 
Since it was introduced, buckthorn has been able to spread by a number of ways. Buckthorn reproduces by seed. Uh, the seeds are spread quickly by birds and mammals because they actually move through the digestive system quickly and the animals excrete the seeds away from the parent shrub, further enabling its widespread invasion. They can also spread by water. Buckthorn seeds will float. They have been, there have been cases where contaminated soil has provided new locations to buckthorn for buckthorn to take hold. And it spreads from seeds being transported in the mud on boots, uh, tires, and equipment. Buckthorn can be found in dry and moist habitats and will survive in any type of soil, but it does seem to prefer a neutral or alkaline pH. Growth can be limited in deep shade, but still, it still seems to do well in forest understories and along forest edges. In Ontario, you will commonly see it along roadsides, fence lines, and woodland edges, pastures, and abandoned fields. Common buckthorn is a woody plant uh, that ranges in size from a shrub to a small tree. A tree will either have a male or female flowers, but not both. And buckthorn is closely related to two other species, glossy buckthorn, which is another invasive from Europe, and alderleaf buckthorn, which is a native shrub. The twigs have a small thorn-like uh, tip, and are, those are generally located at the end of the twig. The leaves are opposite to sub-opposite, um, but they are generally always opposite. And the leaves have three to five strong curved veins per side, which are arched towards the tip of the leaf, so much like a, like a dog, dogwood leaf. Buck, buckthorn has inconspicuous four-petal flowers, which are greenish-yellow. And then the berries of the, of the tree are black and are produced in late July and August, where it sets seeds rapidly on the female trees only. Immature fruit, uh, green, fruit green in color, and the berries appear in dense clusters in the leaf axils. Each berry contains three to four seeds, and these will remain on the tree well into the winter. So some impacts of buckthorn. Buckthorn can impact biodiversity by changing the nitrogen composition of the soil and this can permanently alter soil chemistry making it harder for other species to survive. It has shown that sites with buckthorn invasions often have a lower species richness count and a higher concentration of weedy and exotic species including invasive honeysuckle species. Songbirds can negative, be negatively effective, affected as well. For example, nesting birds in buckthorn are more susceptible to predators because they end up building their nests lower in the canopy. The leaves of buckthorn come out weeks earlier than other native plants and they lose their leaves later as well. This allows the, them to outcompete other species for sunlight. This is particularly harmful in hardwood forests and reduces the abundance of native species as wildflowers. Uh, land manage, managers of wooded or open areas in southern Ontario are likely familiar with the common buckthorn due to its fast spread. It impacts forestry by forming dense, even-aged stands that suppress other vegetation and prevent natural regeneration in forests and woodlands because of its long growing season. It is the greatest impact on disturbed sites, and once established on the edge, it will uh, spread into the interior of the forest. So for common buckthorn, we, uh, I've gone through our BMP. Now, we did not uh, have a table made up for this one because this was one of our earlier BMPs. However, I will go over briefly some of the control options. So pulling should occur in mid-October to mid-November because this will reduce any disturbance to the surrounding vegetation and aid uh, in accurately identifying common buckthorn. Mo moist soil is ideal for pulling. It makes it easier to pull out. And using a weed wrench tool is uh, an also a really good option because you can get larger plants, uh, larger trees that way. If girdling, the cut should be at least three inches in diameter to make sure it will not close back up. And this will weaken the tree as it suppresses the ac accessibility of nutrients throughout the tree. Buckthorn can also be cut down and piled and burned on site to prevent the spread. If you're using herbicides, they should be applied to girdle area, girdled areas and uh, on cut trees to prevent any re-sprouting. Immediate application of herbicide to a fresh cut allows for better absorption and may reduce the need for repeated application. Sites must be monitored for the next few seasons to ensure the control of seedlings and re-sprouts. Uh, mowing will reduce stem number and vigor and will often kill off most seedlings. 
and mowing should be done in early or late summer for at least two consecutive years. As far as biological control, testing is ongoing on two psyllids, so two sap sucking lice, and a seed feeding midge, but testing is still in the very early stages. Research on the relationship between common buckthorn and soil organisms and pathogens will be conducted in the future as well. As far as chemical, um, some techniques that are used for treating buckthorn are the, cunt, the cut stump method and then after girdling spraying, as mentioned. If you want more information on um, chemical control, there's a lot more information in the BMP as far as the herbicides that people use and the percentage of solution for that. So I encourage you to go online and, and uh, read a little bit more about that. One more thing, the, there is uh, livestock usually find buckthorn seedlings quite tasty and will successfully control new generation um, in pastured areas once the fence-like shrubs have been removed. But this is not recommended for high quality natural areas because it will trample nearby native vegetation. And lastly, fire can be a very effective um, feasible way to control buckthorn. So just a few things to mention um, after you've controlled the species, the importance of restoration and monitoring. It's extremely important to make sure that you're um, keeping an eye on the sites that you've controlled. So there's all kinds of different ideas. Um, you can mulch the site to reduce light availability, um, and then that allows shade tolerant native species to germinate. Um, you can seed the site. Uh, you can also have larger plantings, so potted plants, uh, to give them more of an advantage to grow over any invasive seedlings that have germinated after control is complete. And then just the importance of monitor monitoring. With any of the control options listed in the module, monitoring should be repeated throughout the growing season to ensure plants are not resprouting. Also, as far as disposal, any uh, removal of invasive plants will require proper disposal of the plant. So some things to keep in mind is to not compost invasive plants. Um, and it's a good idea to solarize the plants so you can place them in a black plastic bag, seal them tightly and leave them in direct sunlight for one to three weeks. This will cook the plant and after that you can throw them in your local landfill. Uh, Pulled plants which have flowered may still produce seeds, so they, do, they should not be left on site as well. And then in this picture you can see that um, the, the plants are put in um, municipal comp are brought to a municipal compost facility, so they're in yard waste bags. So if the municipal compost reaches high enough temperatures to kill the seeds and plants, then you can bring them to the compost facility. So if the Plants must be kept on, if you absolutely have to keep the plants on site, you can build a compound, so a wooden compound, as you can see in the picture, and this will keep them contained in one place. And th if you are doing this, you need to make sure that you are monitoring this area regularly. So just a few more things that the Ontario Invasive Plant Council always like to, to remind people um, about preventing the spread of invasive plants. So if you see an invasive plant, please report it. Take a picture, record the location, and contact the Invading Species Hotline. Um, keep an eye out now that you've, you know, you've listened to this presentation. You can probably identify some of these plants out there. Uh, monitor hedges, property lines, fence line, because early detection is really key to you know, spotting these invasive species and getting them removed. Stay off the trail, so avoid traveling off trail and in areas known to have invasive species. Stop the spread. Remove, inspect, clean the mud from your from your clothing, your shoes, and your pets to make sure that you're not carrying seeds and plant foods with you to new areas. Keep it natural. Try to avoid disturbing soil uh, and never remove native plants from natural areas. This leaves the soil bare and vulnerable to invasive species. And then also use native species. Try to use local native species in your garden. Uh, never use invasive plants in your garden or hedgerows. And encourage your local garden center to sell non-invasive or native plants. Well, one last thing, I want to just mention the EDMAPS Ontario program. If you do see invasive plants and you want to report them, this is a great program. Um, you just need to make create an account and this program will help you easily map the invasive species that you found. You can look at other distribution maps from across the province of the plants in your area. Uh, you can learn about other invasive species in your area. And there's also a new phone app, which is useful if you're out in the field. 
So thank you very much. I know it's uh, we're close to the end of the hour. I hope that that was informative. And I guess, David, you'll open it up for questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Rochelle. That was a very interesting presentation on some of the invasive plants that threaten the landscape in Canada and the management options that are available. And I know that we were experiencing a little bit of a slow connection in there, so thanks for sticking with it and delivering a smooth presentation uh, with the challenges. But we do have some time left over for questions, so if anyone has a question for Rochelle, please enter it into the side panel of the GoToWebinar program now, and we'll try and answer as many as we can. Um, Rochelle, the first question I have for you, you mentioned throughout your presentation a lot of best management practices, so where, where can these be found? Yes, yeah, so we have on our website at ontarioinvasiveplants.ca, we have a location um, that is called the BMP Library. And in that, if, you, if people click on that, they'll be able to see, I think there's about 12 BMPs. We also have some that we're, we're finalizing and should be up, and we're also updating some of them. But um, they're a great resource. Um, people who have used them have, have we've gotten a lot of great feedback on them, and they seem to help people figure out um, how to best approach the control efforts um, towards their invasive plant management strategy. Um, after you do control for an invasive plant and remove it, what species should you plant afterwards? Yeah, so we, we get this question a lot and um, basically our experts who we've talked to have often mentioned um, really if you know the site already, you know what has been growing in the area prior, it's always best to just try to uh, reestablish those species. Those are the ones that you know, are naturally growing there. So that's really the key um, message there is to try to reestablish what's already been growing there. Now, obviously, we talked about with garlic mustard, um, if you're controlling and you want to try to plant some bloodroot and mayapple to try to outcompete some of the seedlings coming up, that's also a really good option. Thank you. And if nobody has any additional questions, um, we can end the webinar. So on behalf of everyone, I would like to thank Rochelle for joining us today and giving us some insight into the world of invasive forest plants. And a big thank you to everyone who logged on today to view our presentation and to those of you who have joined us every Thursday so far for every webinar in the series. A recording of each presentation will be posted on our website at www.forestinvasives.ca under the Learn and Participate tab. Thank you again to everyone who joined us today and have a great afternoon.